In this video, we're going to create a generative fabric designer using JavaScript and more specifically using uh, D3JS to create the uh, different SVG patterns and then visualize them. Now, this is part two of two. In the first video, what we did was we gathered the imagery and prepared them from an archive of botanical watercolor, specifically um, the USDA's Pomological Watercolor Collection. Now, if you haven't seen that video, I would suggest you just go back to have a look for a quick look for some context, uh, but it's not necessary. All the elements in order to create our gender fabric designer really are just a collection of images, um, more or less scaled to the, the same size, and then a JSON file detailing where we're going to often get those things. So uh, this is the finished article of the fabric designer. Now notice they're not just flat patterns, we're also kind of trying to visualize what they would look like in uh, as a shirt. Uh, so uh, the generative fabric designer basically stitches these images together in different sizes, um, in different combinations of the different uh, Im uh, images and fruits and flowers and uh, nuts and things that you get here. And we've got a button to just keep on generating and you have this kind of endless scroll capability of going down and generate more and more and more patterns until we're happy and we found a fabric that we like and we can use it and uh, express ourselves with a nice new shirt. So let's start by taking a look at this shirt graphic over here that we're going to use to help us visualize these different designs. This shirt graphic I have here is in SVG format. If I inspect it here, you'll see it's just um, all the different parts are, are just path elements. So for example, um, I've, I've, or, I've arranged it all and organized it all into, uh, into groups. So we've got the, the front side of the shirt and the back of the shirt. And if I descend in, you'll see that the outlining here is filled with black. Um, so that's just a, a, a path element as well. Um, then I've got a group for the lining elements, which I'll explain that in a second. And then there's another group that I've organized for, um, for the various parts, the different parts of the material. And that's it then, you know, you, we've got, the, we've got the, the back of the shirt, which is a little bit simpler, uh, as it were. Now, parts of the shirt we're going to want to fill with our pattern, whereas other parts are going to be filled with, with lining. Now in SVG, you can, you can fill with the color such as we have at the moment. So for example, this part here, this sort of inner inside of the shirt is currently filled with, uh, let's see, the lining, the lining group. Actually, I've set the fill on the group so I don't need to repeat um, the style across all the different path elements um, into this kind of beige color, um, which is kind of the same as I've got for the main, let's say these are right sides here of the material. So this has a fill, right? So I can set the colors for every different part of the shirt because it's composed of these different path elements. Now I was saying, um, path elements can be filled with patterns. If we take a look at the MDN docs, it tells us a little bit about the pattern element. And you can see that the way that you use it is that you need to, inside your SVG, put it inside the depth element. Now the depth element uh, is, is actually there to hold any elements and things that you're not going to see immediately, but that you're going to address later on SVG, such as patterns. So for example, here we've got these circles and the way that you fill with the pattern is you provide a URL and address the pattern with an ID. So I've actually set one up here already. So I've got um, a pattern inside the death element and I just called it left. So if I change the fill attribute to URL and I give it the ID 
left, then I have a kind of repeating picture of uh, some apples here, which, let me just check how I did that. So the pa inside patterns, inside the pattern element, I have, um, I actually have a few images. Now we'll see this better if I put it on the rectangle. So I'm gonna fill the rectangle with this URL left. Okay, so there's multiple images here and, and they will they will repeat. Uh, so if I actually, I make it bigger. Let me, let me make this much bigger. I should be able to, why does that not look bigger? It doesn't look bigger because the, the, the size of our SVG in fact itself is, is limited to a certain height. Um, uh, there we go. So there you go. You get the you get the idea. We can we can we can fill uh, with a pattern that we've we've addressed um, inside defs. Now some of these images have slightly different heights and widths. So in our pattern, some gaps might show. Um, at the moment, these images are actually quite well aligned and sized but if i reduce the size for example of this of this peach here and um, you'll see that there are some gaps now there are loads of clever ways of dealing with these um these inconsistencies and gaps one of the things that you can do is use a sort of masonry layout or some javascript to um try and tile appropriately where everything should go Today I'm not going to do anything fancy. I'm just going to draw a big rectangle um, that these images can sit on top of uh, that are filled with uh, um, a color that uh, more or less uh, agrees with the background of these different watercolor images. Now that's one advantage of this uh, of the set is in fact that they are um, they they do share a kind of similar background tone color. So. I'm going to do that by popping in a rectangle in our pattern here. Um, it's going to be, I guess, 400, 400. And I'll give the fill. I'm going to refresh to see if that okay. worked. And let me check the pattern. Pattern, pattern. So there's the rectangle. Um, I'm going to reduce the size of one of the the width of one of the images. And you see there that it still has a reasonable, um, reasonably agreeable background for that. All right, now we fixed our, our pattern here. Let's try applying it across, uh, across the whole our shirt here. So going to apply the pattern fill across each path element. So I've changed that fill, uh, find and replace with the URL of ID left. So we've addressed, uh, we've dressed our pattern for all of the, well, for the front shirt, we've not done it for the back yet, but uh, notice of course that it still doesn't look quite right because when you have a big, uh, big sheet of material and you cut it up and you stitch it together as uh, Taylor would, then your pattern is going to show up. Uh, your shirt isn't going to look anything like this with as if, as if a projector had just projected the pattern flat onto the shirt. It doesn't going to look, it's not going to look like that. So in fact, for every path element here, for every cut of material, uh, it's, I believe it's called pattern cutting. Um, we need to, in fact, alter the pattern in some way. And most realistically, the way it would work is that we probably just want to translate the pattern so that it's no longer going to match up anymore. Now, uh, in SVG, we can't just, on the path element, we can't just say, um, take the pattern and transform it somewhat. In fact, what you have to do is transform the pattern itself. Now, we've only got one pattern, and if we do any transformations, it's going to shift across the whole uh, the whole shirt graphic as it is, right? So the only way to do this is to in fact create a pattern for each uh, for each cut. So for each sleeve and the left side and the right side and the collar, each of those will have its own pattern. Now that sounds quite onerous, um, 
and it sounds like we're going to end up with tons of markup. However, SVG pattern element allows you to define a base pattern that you can then manipulate certain attributes. So let's take a look at doing that. What I'm going to do is create a new pattern here. Um, so we've got this empty pattern and we're going to give it an ID of right. So imagine we're going to do the right side of the shirt and using what's called pattern transform and the pattern transform attribute, we can sort of shift the pattern over and make it look a little bit we're basically breaking the alignment of um, the pattern on the left side. So pattern transforms can be rotate, skews, and scales. Um, I'm just going to translate. So I translate, um, so pattern transform equals uh, translate, um, and I'm just going to chuck some, I don't know, 100, 150 um, X and, and Y coordinates, and now the magic bit of the puzzle is that href attribute. Excellent, href. Oh, sorry, okay, here we go, attributes. So this uh, href attribute references a, a template pattern that provides this sort of default values for your, uh, for your pattern. So what we can do is say href left, I'm not sure if it has to be like that, Hash left. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Um, ID left. Uh, the ID is right. And our pattern transform translates a little bit. So let's go and try and apply that to our um, to our shirt here. Okay. So we're gonna refresh. Now on the right side, it's filled with left. So let's change that to right. And now it looks a little bit different. Um, if we go up and we, let's manipulate that um, pattern transform a little bit. And wow, look, look, look at that. That's the, we have the beginnings of a more realistic depiction of what a shirt will look like once it's finished and tailored. Now there are some other parts of the shirt that we would also like to dress. So uh, we have a pattern for the sleeves and the cuffs, and you could go um, so far as to doing an individual one for the collar. I'm just going to define another three patterns here. So we'll have uh, one to, uh, we'll have five in total, and I'll apply some rotation. And so we now have uh, the right side, which is just gonna be kind of um, straight, but translated, and the ID L123. So it's based on left and it's just one, two, three. And I'm just going to, um, I guess, randomly assign these to the different parts of the shirts, to the sleeves and whatnot, because it, chances are it'll kind of look a bit rotated in, in real life. So let's do that. Down at our shirt, we've got the front. This is, these are the line in, in this group, we've got the lining stuff. So let's not touch those. And here we have some of the material. And uh, this is the left cuff. Okay, I've added these classes not for any styling purposes, just to make it a bit easier for me to, to deal with the left cuff, the right cuff the sleeve, um, the right shoulder. Uh, you know what, to make this a look different, we could just use right. Um, L3 and the whole placket. There you go, placket is gonna be, placket is gonna be different too. That's it, that was a new word for me, placket. Um, all right, so we have a more realistic shirt depiction. Now we've hand coded a fabric and shirt design, it's time to try doing the same thing, but automating it with some code.
In the last video, we downloaded and prepared a collection of images from the USDA's archive. We also created a JSON file listing all the images that we had downloaded, the IDs, and um, where we're going to store and, and, and fetch them. So I've actually uploaded these to a server that I can use uh, later on, and, and I've kept the file name so I can address them using those images. Now, I've prepared a template here uh, based on uh, the, the, the kind of hard-coded uh, SVG page that we were working on earlier with the starter, but I've added D3 version 7, and I have added a little bit of uh, D3 code. Uh, in the meantime, um, I would like to show you the JSON file. So we've got that JSON file here um, with our various uh, our various sources. So we're where we where we actually got the thumbnail from, um, the name of the file name, and therefore where we can then um, go and retrieve it using our own server rather than. Um, going off and hitting the USD archive all the time. So uh, I have here uh, a little bit in script here. I'm using the d3json to fetch function to go off, get that JSON, and then return that result set in, um, in a variable called fruit. So we've got a little callback function going on here. Um, so when that runs, it goes off and fetches um, that JSON file that we're showing you there. And there we go. We get um, a couple of the results back. Now, what I've done is I've used D3 shuffle. So basically, this just randomizes um, the elements in an array. And now that fruits result will be as big as, uh, I'm not sure how many entries we've got in there, um, but it will be bigger than that. To start with, we're just going to create a pattern with three images in it. So um, I've decided to compile a selection of um, three fruits, just the first three. It will be random every time we refresh this page because of, of, of shuffle. And I've added to get started this create fabric uh, function, which um, takes in an array of those JSON objects with our safe fruits and it creates a pattern or actually it creates multiple patterns for an individual shirt. So um, I'll explain this in due course. So here we go. We've got this is the this is kind of the main um, meat of, of what the function does, which is to add for every one of the for every a ele uh, element in that array, it will add an image element. So we've got a JSON object that has the file name, and I've provided a base URL, which is my server where I've, I've going, I'm hosting um, the images separately, the images that I prepared in in step one, in the first in the first video. So uh, the href of that image is being set by using the file name and the base URL and the width we were specifying with image width and this could actually at the moment this doesn't need to be a function it could just be image width right we're just fixing the image width and we are also uh, using a function to set the x value for the image now image width is defined here at the top. So image width is a kind of function of the base width. So the base width is the actual uh, is the width of our of our pattern. Now we've just we've just fixed this to three hundred. Now the image width is just going to be, or we're just going to take the the base width and divide it by the size of the selection. So if we've got we've got three images then the width of each image is in the pattern is going to be about 100 pixels. And um, the height is, um, we're using that base width and multiplying by 1.59, which is the approximate aspect ratio of, the, of these images. Uh, so that kind of explains those 
those variables there. The ID suffix. Now, the ID for every one of our patterns has to be unique. So I'm generating a suffix here that we're going to kind of uh, that we're going to depend on to the IDs to ensure all our patterns are, are uniquely addressable. And the way I'm doing this is, uh, this may look a little bit odd, uh, new date minus here, what on earth does that mean? Well, when you, the joy of JavaScript, when you do a kind of numeric operation on, on dates, it actually just returns a timestamp. So we just get a kind of numeric timestamp as the ID suffix. And I showed you there, I could have talked a little bit about how the images are appended to our pattern, but the pattern element itself or a group of patterns for one shirt um, is created here where I take the base pattern, um, our hand hard-coded pattern, which you see on the right, and I just clone it. So there's already a, well, there's already a pattern that we've uh, defined in our depths element um, over here, so we've got one single, I keep saying a single pattern, there's multiple pattern elements, but the idea is the multiple rep pattern elements represent one, uh, one shirt. So we've actually got a group of patterns, uh, pattern elements in, grouped in this idea of, of base fabric. So we're taking that base fabric, we're gonna copy that group, and all of the, everything is copied in its entirety, but we want to alter the uh, some of the contents of our copied group. So the first thing, of course, for the group is to alter the uh, the ID. So every every element should have a unique ID. The next thing we do is we select what in the kind of cloned group there we have ID of left, and then we append on our ID suffix. And then we resize um, according to our base width and base height. Um, and then the next thing that we do is go in and, as I was explaining, perform that data join and on the images inside the pattern. So in this case, because we're cloning, we do actually have images in there, but the join will either add, update, or remove any images that are in there. And then finally, to show us what's going on, I target, I select ID of test, um, which is a rectangle and fill it with our new, our new pattern with the ID suffix. So uh, let's have a look at what this looks like. Now that test element is just a rectangle. So let's refresh. So let's take a moment and take a look at this. So our test rectangle has a URL of left dash, and then there's the timestamp. If we take a look at the SVG dash element inside here, we have what's called a base fabric, which we're using for the shirt here. So this is the base fabric. Every time I refresh this, this doesn't change. This is always the same pattern, um, but our rectangle here is being updated. So we've got a base fabric that never changes. It's using that Apple image, Apple image there. And then we have a new group where we have pattern of ID left with the timestamp. And we've got a rectangle and we've got our new uh, new fruit images. Now, I still have a little bit of work to do because I've cloned, I've cloned this base fabric group and the patterns inside. Now we've cloned the group and everything within it. So we've got the pattern, uh, we've, we've got the pattern um, with left plus that suffix, um, we've called instead of base fabric, we've called it ba uh, fabric plus ID. Now, however, we still have um, some IDs here to update because we've got those and we're duplicating those uh, IDs. So we want to update those IDs as well. So the way to do that is to select those IDs that appear within um, the pattern group, or as I've called it, the kind of fabric 
uh, I've given that ID, the ID of a fabric. And we're selecting within that group, we're selecting right and then just updating the href and the ID. So they now, as the base pattern, they reference our, our pattern with our new images. And for each one, we alter the ID to have that ID suffix. So now we have unique, uh, unique IDs for each one of our, uh, our kind of uh, left pattern and all the variations. Now we've generated a new fabric pattern and we'll basically just do be doing the same sort of operation for generating a new shirt. We'll have a base shirt, we're just going to copy it over and update the IDs of the patterns in order to uh, display our new fabric across the, the shirt visualization. So uh, one thing I want to fix first though is um, I don't think I got one of the values right on the on the sizing here. So I'm just going to fix the base height of the pattern to make it half so that we always have a completely filled uh, filled pattern, all right? Um, now, okay, so what I've done to get us, get us going is I've created a uh, create shirt function. So this function works very, uh, very much in the same way as the fabric one does in that um, we come up with a shirt ID. Uh, notice though we get, we pass in the ID suffix. So that ID that was generated for our uh, for our fabric pattern, we're going to need to use that in order to to set the fills of our of our, of our new shirt that we're going to add uh, add to the page. So we've got our ID suffix. We're generating a new shirt ID, and now one thing is, if we just entirely copy the shirt and just clone it, we also need to um, shift it along a bit so that it doesn't just um, sort of paste on top of the shirt that we had before. Um, so we're going to move on by 795 pixels. And of course, if we put this in a loop and start generating more and more shirts, we're going to have to advance um, those X, Y coordinates for every shirt that we add. Um, so we select our base shirt with uh, using the ID, we clone it, and we, I've got this sort of saying of style of block here because you could maybe hide the base shirt, but I, I don't feel you need to do that. But anyway, that just makes sure that it's visible. We give it a class, again, that's just to help us read through the markup. Um, and then here, here's the important part is that we need to give this shirt its own ID, make sure that the IDs are all unique, and then we, will shift the position of this new shirt graphic over. Now, the real magic is here. What we need to do to apply the new path to the shirt is start by, by selecting all the paths within the um, within our new, our new shirt. Our shirt group, it's actually a, our base shirt and our new shirt, the thing we've just cloned is a group and it contains all, uh, all those paths. And what we need to do is a bit of a find and replace operation using, using some uh, sort of select all expression here. So we're gonna, we wanna select all the paths that have a fill attribute that begins with URL. So that's what this does. And it, uh, so we've got collection of paths. And once we have those paths for each of those paths, we need to set the fill with our new, our new pattern ID. Now, for example, I've, I've, I've noted it here. So for example, what, what would be left for the left side of the shirt is going to become left plus timestamp using the ID suffix. So we get the current fill value. So that'll be URL um, bracket hash 
left and we're going to replace the closing bracket with dash and a suffix and another closing bracket. So um, that left becomes uh, left dash timestamp. And then we return the ID of the shirt that we just generated um, so that we can maybe address it later on. Now, our create fabric function returns the ID suffix. So that gets us ready to pass it into create shirt. So I'm gonna let this fly. And voila, we've got a nice new, oh, this is great, this one. It's got avocado here. I love it. And then when we hit the refresh button, you could do this all day long. Look at those. Fantastic. Now with that, we've actually reached a point where the finished version isn't substantially different from the code that we have there. The code that we've written is more or less the basis of this finished article. As you can see, um, for each shirt and fabric design that's been added, um, we've advanced the X and Y coordinates for each shirt. Um, another thing that I've done is to put the create fabric and create, create shirt functions inside this generate, sh uh, function, generate shirts function, which specifies a loop. So what we're doing is we're running that shuffle function um, once every uh, one or four shirts, and I can't remember exactly how many it was, so we have the pattern, we're using the same pattern, but what I'm doing is I'm specifying a scale property that gets passed into the create fabric function. So uh, we reuse the same images, but switch up the scale for every, uh, for I think one, every sort of third, for each, uh, for each step. And then on the fourth step, we end up um, switching over to uh, shuffling. So we have new images for a new fabric pattern. That's about it really. So the code for the finished shirt designer is on glitch. I'll post links to that. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you for watching and I will catch you again.